Hi, I'm Bernard Leong, and you may know me as an executive who directed teams to work on social media and digital campaigns. And in my spare time, I want to know the latest trends from the Global Digital Report. You're listening to Analyze Asia, the weekly podcast dedicated to business, technology, and media in Asia. And today I have none other than Simon Kemp, founder and CEO of Capios. Welcome, Simon, and it's great to have you back again for our podcast for 2019. Thanks, Bernard. Thanks for having me back as well. So since our last conversation, what have you been up to? It's been quite a lot of time since we last spoke, so I've been quite busy. So I'm guessing we'll talk about this quite a lot in today's show, but the most sort of pressing thing I've been doing recently is the launch of our Digital 2019 reports. So those came out just a couple of weeks ago, and since then we have been travelling the world doing presentations to kind of help people make sense of all the numbers in those reports. So it's been pretty hectic since we last spoke. Totally agree, because we actually have to work on how to get today's recording actually happening because we were trying to work on each of our calendars, and also part of it's my fault too. I also understand that you have started working on podcast too. So you want to talk a little bit about some of the podcast projects you've been working on? Yeah, so a lot of these have been talking to people all around the world about what they're most interested in in the reports. We did one in person in Toronto, which was fascinating because that was all about multicultural marketing activities. So that was really interesting with a lady called Catherine Bussman on her Worldly Marketer podcast. So if you're interested in all the sorts of multicultural stuff, then I definitely recommend checking that podcast out. Uh, we've been doing quite a lot of stuff with Hootsuite as well. So Hootsuite are one of the sponsors for the Digital 2019 reports and they've been doing a whole series of events around the world where I've been speaking and we've done some recordings as part of that as well. So that's been quite fun. Basically, you know me Bernard, anybody that wants to talk about numbers, I'm more than happy to get involved. So uh, most invitations I get to talk about these kinds of new insights and stuff, I'm very excited to, to do, join those people on their podcasts. But for today, I'm most interested to talk about the Asia stuff with you. And because we've done this a few times, this is one that I always look forward to because you've always got great questions and it's always nice to dig into the home numbers and thank you so much and of course our main topic of the day is the global digital report 2019 i want to start out by asking you what are the key numbers main observations and trends for the report in 2019 Yeah, so the big numbers this year on a global level were the acceleration of adoption of the internet. So this was quite a surprise from my perspective. I've been tracking these numbers for nine years now, and we've already passed the halfway mark in terms of internet penetration a couple of years ago. So I kind of expected to see that the growth rates would start declining, but actually that's not the case at all. So what we've been seeing is actually an increase in the number of new users over recent months compared to the 2018 report that we published this time last year. So an average of 1 million people are starting to use the internet for the very first time every single day at the moment, which is really quite a staggering number. So it was that acceleration was the real standout number. But I think there were a a few other interesting surprises in there as well, especially around the social media numbers. I think given things like the Cambridge Analytica scandal last year and all of the stuff around GDPR and the European focus on privacy, we we're expecting to see some slight declines maybe in the growth rates for social media. But in reality, all of the data that we reported in the 2019 studies show very little impact, if any impact at all, from those changes. So still very strong social media user numbers, lots of growth, both in terms of the number of people using social media, but also in terms of the time spent and in terms of the number of different platforms that people are using too. So there were some some interesting surprises in those numbers. I think we should probably have a dig into the individual platforms if that's of interest to you today. Um, So some interesting ups and downs in the numbers. But yeah, I think overall, just a very solid year of growth across all things digital, which given the sort of the challenges around privacy and stuff like that, it was a little bit of a surprise. I think this is interesting. What do you think are the possible reasons that why it is still accelerating? Is it just because people do not care about their privacy as what usually many digital analysts usually says? Not sure that they don't care. Let's come back to that in just a minute. I think the main driver for the growth, though, was a lot of very strong growth in developing parts of APAC. So the biggest growth this year came in India, where we saw almost 100 million people start using the internet for the first time in 2018. Just a staggering number. When I have conversations with people in India about the concepts of privacy, most of them just smile at me and say, what do you think you're going to learn about me based on my digital behaviours that would be of any interest to anybody? So it's not that they don't care about privacy, but I think you know the, the kinds of stuff that they're doing online, I don't think that 
you know, just based on those conversations, the Indian community at the moment don't really feel that there's a massive kind of threat to their overall livelihood in terms of what they're sharing on social media. And I think, you know, that the trade-off there is the most important bit. The benefits that they perceive from using social media versus the things that they perceive might go wrong from those companies collecting their data. The trade-off is very clearly in their benefit in the way that they perceive it. So, you know, I think it's really interesting. You speak to somebody in Europe about privacy and the media has kind of given them all of these perspectives as to why they should be nervous. But in reality, the average person on the street, they they talk about privacy, but they don't quite know what is actually at risk when they talk about social media data and stuff. I mean, they think, you know, I'm posting photos of my lunch, I'm I'm chatting to my friends and family about basic things. And most of that data, it's not really like it's terrifyingly scary if it gets shared you know a lot of those conversations are just the same sorts of conversations we would be having in a public cafe when anybody else could eavesdrop on them anyway so I think the average person on the street much as they are very worried about privacy I think they also sort of look at the stuff they share on social media and see it as less dangerous perhaps than you know like sharing your bank account details and stuff like that which would definitely be something people would be worried about so yeah I think there's a a careful trade-off there but the growth is less about people not worrying about privacy it's much more about perceived cost benefit analysis if people do those kinds of things in their mind totally understood and one thing i like about your reports simon is that you always iterate and build on top of what you have done the previous year so what i'm very curious to know for this year have you included new data sets from other organizations on top of what the team has already done have you included new data sets from other organizations on top of what your team has done for 2018 yeah so we included a few new things this year in particular we've included a lot more detailed data for each of the main western social media platforms i would have loved to include the eastern social media platforms as well but frustratingly they choose not to publish data and even when we request it from platforms like tencent they decide not to share anything with us which is a bit annoying so we can't tell you quite what's happening as well in Asia as we do across the sort of the Western platforms, although obviously things like Facebook are still very popular across APAC as well. So yeah, lots of rich data for Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat and LinkedIn. And we've got most of those for pretty much every single country in the world. The only exception is Snapchat, where the data is only available for about 80 countries around the world, but that's still pretty decent. Then on top of that, we've got a little bit of data for things like the use of voice commands and voice search. We've got a little bit more data on people's privacy concerns going back to what we talked about before in particular this year we've got a great set of data from global web index on how people perceive the way companies use their data so that's very interesting stuff and then perhaps one of the most provocative data sets one of the ones that we've already had a lot of questions about is the adoption of cryptocurrencies around the world which i thought was quite interesting so before i go into all those areas i want to ask you so if you zoom down to asia pacific and i think you already mentioned that actually is still driving most of the growth in terms of for digital, for new mobile users, social media users. Are there any new insights for the region since our last conversation? I don't think there's anything that stands out as being dramatically different. Obviously, lots of healthy growth in there is always a good story. And I think that's the sort of thing that a lot of marketers and business people around the region will be interested in. So what are the platforms that people are using? Are there any up and down trends versus previous years? But I wouldn't say there's anything dramatically sort of, it's not a revolution, if you like. There's just plenty of evolution since last year. But I think the fact that you've got such healthy growth across APAC is very reassuring. So we saw a 10% increase in internet users across APAC over the last 12 months. So 200 million people across the region came online. 100 million of those were in India. So, you know, India is the standout story for the region. But, you know, that's that's still very healthy. And I'm, I'm very optimistic about what that means for the future. In terms of the social media activity, that was up even greater relative growth. So 12% growth year on year for APAC and social media users. That was almost 220 million new users over the last 12 months. So yeah, I think there's plenty of reason to be optimistic about digital in APAC. But like I said, I don't see anything dramatically different. I'm wondering whether that's going to change this year. I have my suspicions that we might start to see a little bit of changes in behavior this year, especially around social media. I'm, I'm wondering whether we're going to start to see some new platforms coming through and whether we're going to see some of those really start to take off. In our last conversation, you have actually talked about the importance of voice search and voice commands before Asia Pacific. In fact, I think I recall you mentioned that the Chinese and the Indians are probably going to use voice search much more readily as compared to the Western audience because of the language complexity. 
so what I'm very curious to know, I mean, I looked at this year's data, I saw the voice search and voice commands data that you came up with. How was the data compiled and has there been an increase in usage with voice in Asia Pacific and what are the key applications for the voice search and commands? So this data comes from Global Web Index, which is a survey of a huge number of internet users around the world. So the latest conversations I've had with Global Web Index suggest that they're interviewing a panel of more than 20 million people around the world on a regular basis. And that represents more than 90% of the world's internet users in terms of the coverage that 22 million people and give a basis of understanding of. So a very, very broad base of serve of these different countries that they include. So they in include a very nice broad uh, set of countries. There's 44, 45, I think, in the countries that they cover at the moment. Um, so they, they go out and they interview people on a quarterly basis. So we get new data every three months. The latest data that we've got, I think it's actually because the last conversation we had, I think, was in Q3 last year. The arrangement that we've got with Global Web Index in terms of the data that we're able to share, we don't actually have dramatically different updated data compared to the last time you and I spoke about this. But I think if you look at the way that the data has changed, over the time periods that Global Web Index have been collecting this, it's quite interesting to see how quickly growth has been taking place in APAC in particular. So you've got India, China and Indonesia are currently the top three countries in Global Web Index's study for the use of voice search and voice commands. Each of those three countries, almost half of internet users already using voice search and voice commands. And I just want to stress that that's only for those two activities. So voice search and voice commands doesn't include the use of voice on platforms like WeChat to send messages to your friends and stuff, for example, which I think if anybody's been to China at any point in the last couple of years, they know that voice is the absolute dominant means of communication on a platform like WeChat. So this data doesn't even include that kind of behavior. It's just for things like controlling your device with your voice or using it to conduct a, a search on something like Google. So it's just really interesting that I think APAC is leading that. I think there's a couple of reasons why APAC is so big on voice activity stuff. One of them is the language stuff, exactly like you mentioned. It's just a lot easier to use voice than it is to try and fiddle around with some of the alphabets, especially when you think about the way that keypads work on mobile phones. If you've got a huge character set like you would do in Mandarin, it's just a lot more straightforward to use your voice than to try and find these characters. And then I think also just in terms of complexity, of trying to learn how to use typing stuff if you're not a digital native, if you've just started using the internet today. The difference between learning how to type something versus being able to just speak into your phone in the way you would speak to somebody else, it's very clear which of those is easier. And if you can just speak with a normal voice, then you can definitely see the appeal of that. So I think that's one of the main reasons why around the region it's been the, the main driving force for you know the acceleration of voice use across APAC. This is interesting because I'm actually visiting China almost once every month in the last year. And what I see myself doing more and more is actually audio messaging my Chinese counterparts. It seems to be much more intuitive. The fact is that you are not even including the WeChat data. And imagine if audio messaging is actually included, then I think that data is actually much more than actually what you already have. Absolutely. Yeah, so I think if you look at a platform like WeChat, I don't actually have data for this, but from what I see and from what I hear from everybody that uses it, it's by far the default behavior is to record those audio messages. So yeah, I mean, you're, you're looking at the vast majority of WeChat users are using voice in some capacity on a daily basis. And you know, with WeChat now with more than a billion active users, you, you already start to see very quickly how that adds up to a significant number of the world's internet users very definitely moving towards voice as their primary kind of way of interacting with other people. There's a very interesting internet report that is actually launched by China, they call it Cynic, and have actually compiled a lot of this data on internet trends and they publish every, unfortunately, in Chinese. Do you make any attempts to actually try to translate it at all? Maybe they are also thinking of adding those data for that you might be able to tap onto so that you can improve on it? Yeah, I'd love to get more of that kind of data. I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit frustrated about the level of depth that we can go into in the Chinese stats because, you know, whether it's use of things like voice or even if it's just understanding a bit more about the social media audience, unfortunately, the, the big platforms like Tencent don't break down the audiences that they have by age and by gender and stuff like that, which is data that I think a lot of marketers would be very interested to, to know more about. So, yeah, I mean, I understand the, the complexities of this 
so I'm, I'm not accusing these guys of doing anything wrong in any way. It's just for, from a pure curiosity perspective, I'd love to know more about what's going on. So, yeah, if, if anybody out there spots one of these reports in Mandarin and uh, wants to help me understand a little bit more of what's going in there, then please definitely get in contact with me, share the report, tell me what's happening. Oh, you should talk to Matthew Brennan then because he has actually gave some of the stats, I think in terms of gender usage for WeChat, I think in their recent conferences. But let's move on to the conversation. I'm very curious because you have actually included data from the bigger platforms. So I'm going to start from the big blue app, which is Facebook. With all the growing scandals piling onto Facebook, have you seen decreased growth for the big blue app in Asia Pacific? Or And are there also any hidden impact towards the other two core assets, Instagram and WhatsApp? Because they are also causing problems as well. I mean, WhatsApp is very well known for causing misinformation being spread and even violence across India. So I think it's really interesting. I expected to see some interesting declines in Facebook usage around the world. And interestingly, that wasn't the case. So despite all of those privacy scandals and whatever else, in reality, Facebook doesn't seem to have suffered any dramatic changes in total user base as a result of those activities. So we did see a couple of changes. I'm just trying to load up the data so that I can give you the exact stat. But just in terms of the changes to the overall user base, it, most of the story for Facebook was about growth this year, especially when you look at countries like India, some very strong numbers in there coming through. But when you look at some of the decreases, what was interesting is that there were a couple of countries where we saw some meaningful declines. We did see Thailand go down from a, you know, so I'm just going to focus on the APAC numbers here. So Thailand saw 1 million fewer Facebook users this year versus last year, but that was on a very strong base. And I think what's really important to note there is that there was already some suspicion that the numbers for Thailand have been artificially inflated. So I think Facebook may be behind the scenes removing some fake profiles and some duplicates there, which is pretty good. Interestingly, and this, this one fascinated me, we've historically seen roughly 5 million people in China having a Facebook account. Now, to all intents and purposes, Facebook should be blocked in China. So this is an interesting set of numbers. But China was one of the countries that saw the greatest decrease in users. Now, whether this is as a result of the government's perspective on VPNs and stuff like that, I'm not sure. But those were the only two countries in APAC that saw meaningful drops in Facebook usage. For everything else, it was all just steady growth and decent numbers from Facebook's perspective. So yeah, quite a surprise, I have to say. I didn't expect it to be quite as rosy, but obviously good news for Mark Zuckerberg and team. The, blue, the big blue app, as you called it, still looking good. When you get into the platforms like Instagram, the growth is just incredible. I mean, some amazing numbers right the way across the world. So just in the final quarter of 2018, we saw 4.5% growth in the total user base of Instagram. That's just in three months. It's just incredible. And obviously across APAC, you can imagine, given the size of our region, we had some very strong numbers in there as well. So even for India, we saw some good numbers in there as well for Instagram. Um, the WhatsApp story that you kind of suggested there, some, some rather troubling things happening, especially in India around WhatsApp with misinformation being spread and whatever else. I think it's it's a little bit more difficult to understand that in depth because WhatsApp being encrypted means it's much more difficult to get the data. Facebook does not publish at this time in-depth audience data for WhatsApp in the way that it does for its other platforms. So unfortunately, I can't break that story down any further than what you've already read in the media other than the fact that it's an incredibly big total audience. So the latest numbers that we have, which are now quite old, so they're more than nine months old, I think, but already one and a half billion people around the world using WhatsApp. The one thing I would suggest, though, is that with India being WhatsApp's biggest audience base, the numbers that I have suggest that there are as many people using Facebook as there are using WhatsApp in India. Now, obviously, it depends a little bit on when Facebook decide to update the numbers as to whether or not that continues to be the case. But I think it's probably worth noting that the two of them seem to have an almost equal number of users. There doesn't seem to be a dramatic difference between the two and their user bases. So I think the technoratis who are all voicing their opinions of quitting Facebook has not actually dent even a little bit of their universe. No, and it's, it's fascinating that, isn't it? So we saw this time last year that big delete Facebook movement, which I always found massively ironic that people would come onto social media to tell us that they were going to delete social media. Already that was an indication that this wasn't really going to happen. But yeah, the, there doesn't seem to be any major truth behind that. 
having said that, though, there have been some interesting changes. So within the younger audiences, we saw some really clear changes in behaviour, if you like. So again, just in the final quarter of 2018, on Facebook's core blue platform, we saw the 13 to 17 year old audience down 7%, which is a pretty hefty drop. Now, the assumption amongst an awful lot of people in the media is that all of those users have gone to platforms like Instagram. But what's really interesting, and actually we did not report in the 2019 report because I just didn't have the data quite in time. But what's really interesting is that the Instagram audience also dropped in the final quarter of last year for its 13 to 17 year old audience. So fewer 13 to 17 year olds using Instagram at the start of 2019 compared to October 2018, which was a real shock to everything that I've read and everything that I've seen. I believed the media hype that all of the kids were moving to Instagram and that does not appear to be the case. Where are the kids going? So I'm going to get to the the real arrival of Facebook in Asia Pacific. And I'm, I'm sure you are aware of this. And yeah, right on the dot with it. We are talking about the rise of TikTok, aka Douyin, a video sharing app from the ByteDance group in China that's leading the way. So has your report picked up any data from them? And are they on track to give Facebook a run for their money, given that they're doing so well in Southeast Asia and India? Yeah, so I think as an emerging story in social media, TikTok was definitely one of the standouts for 2018. So they reported half a billion active users in the middle of last year, which was pretty impressive stuff. They just in the last couple of weeks reported that they passed the 1 billion total downloads figure, which again, very impressive stuff. But as you would imagine, me being the massive nerd that I am, I've gone and dug deeper into some of the numbers. It's probably worth noting ByteDance does not publish the breakdowns of data by age and gender and stuff that some of the other platforms who've reported on do. So we need to sort of take the next set of numbers a little bit in a broader context. But I've been looking at the pace of downloads of TikTok. I've been looking at how often people are searching for it around the world. So my numbers are not going to be totally reflective of China here, but for most of the other countries around the world, they should be representative. And what's most interesting is that much as TikTok has definitely got a huge user base, the number of downloads started to decline as of the last week of December and then the number of people searching for TikTok has also declined since the end of December. So despite the fact that it's been a very strong story and there's obviously an awful lot of interest in it, I would suggest that maybe that's already peaked. We may be already looking at the next wave of whatever the next app will be. I just want to say, though, that ByteDance has done an incredible job of producing apps that gain momentum. So the TikTok Douyin story is a really big one from last year. But if you look at other countries, you'll see that there's an app called, I'm going to get this wrong, I think it's Halo, H-E-L-O. Just let me double check this. So yeah, H-E-L-O, another app from those guys. It's just incredible to see that um, sorry, so Halo comes also from ByteDance. Again, so Halo was, for the last quarter of last year, the most downloaded app. So some incredible performance from them there. I don't know whether we're going to see Halo move beyond India, which is kind of where it got the main traction. So lots of interest and opportunities as we move through into l- sort of more 2019 stories. But I don't think TikTok's going to be the big story. They're definitely not moving to Snapchat either. So one of the suspicions is that they've moved away from places like Facebook into Snapchat. But unfortunately, the latest data we have for the advertising audience for Snapchat. So just an important distinction to make here. The advertising audience versus total user base. Whenever I'm talking about numbers in sort of this conversation, I'm always talking about the advertising audience. So the people that you can address with adverts on these platforms. And on Snapchat, that audience was down 12% just in the final three months of 2018. So quite a dramatic drop in terms of that total addressable audience on Snapchat. So the real question is, where are all of these people going? And I think it's really interesting because there is no evidence to suggest that these younger users are moving on to other social network platforms. So the research that I've been doing and the conversations I've been having suggest that actually these these kids, if I don't mean that judgmentally, it's just, you know, the younger users. My suspicion is that they're all moving into much more dedicated kinds of communities. So rather going on to broad based social media network they're actually going into more kind of dedicated places where they can have conversations around the things they care about. So, for example, spending more time on Discord, talking about games, spending more time on what we might have termed forums back in the day. I'm sure they've got a reinvented name now, but, you know, going straight to the places where they can talk about the stuff they care about with the people that care about those things as well. Something I read it? Potentially. So I don't, again, unfortunately have breakdowns of data for the age groups on Reddit, but my suspicion is it's that kind of thing. Whether it's actually Reddit or not, I'm not sure, but it's that kind of 
community based around an interest rather than just a broad-based platform where they can talk about anything. So I would I would suspect that Reddit is in there amongst the mix, but I don't know whether it's going up or down for that age group. So two things come to mind. You said that the downloads for TikTok has actually declined. Would it be because they're moving from a user acquisition to a user retention mode? And the second question is, that actually ByteDance itself in China, other than Douyin, they have also created site apps that are actually dedicated for other age groups. Uh, for example, Huoshan, which some people known for other names, and they have actually create, started to break their segmentation, even Tencent themselves as well. QQ is now like the millennials app, and those guys don't want to be on WeChat. Maybe it's just the way how the Chinese have been segmenting their apps towards their users that might also be causing this decline at the same time that's going on. So I think your supposition that it might be that they're moving from acquisition into sort of maintenance of that audience, there there may be an element of truth there. But I think the way that the data that I'm looking at is reported, I believe that it includes downloads of updated versions of the app as well. So my suspicion is that it's maybe declining a little bit in terms of the popularity. I think that the thing about TikTok in particular is it's not a dramatically diverse app. You kind of do one thing in it, which is record these short form videos. Now, it's obviously incredibly popular, but my suspicion is that it doesn't necessarily have the longevity of some of these other sort of famous social media apps. But exactly as you've pointed out, ByteDance, you know, they've got various different apps. They've got an amazing track record of producing um, apps that have massive amounts of popularity. So I'm very bullish on them as a company. It's interesting, I've spent the last few weeks traveling around the world talking to the investment community as much as I've been talking to marketers. And funnily enough, they've been asking very similar questions to the ones that you have about where are all these users going and what's the next big thing. I'm not going to get into the dangerous world of protecting the next big thing in terms of the apps, but I'm very confident that ByteDance is, you know, they're even if TikTok doesn't maintain its popularity, I would suspect that the next iterations of different apps from ByteDance are going to be, you know, they're definitely one to be watching there. They've got a really strong track record in this. So anecdotally, my wife is the at most anti-social media person in the world. And she downloaded TikTok a few days ago because she was reading about it and watching a lot of people on train station, taxis in Singapore, watching TikTok videos. And then she started looking into it for her own brand and started becoming addicted to dog videos inside. (laughs) It seems that the dog videos are actually gaining more followers than local celebrities in Singapore, which is really tells you a lot about how addictive it can be because it keeps tracking and giving you filter preferences. I mean, and I totally, even I took on the app, I turned it on and watched it for a while. It's retaining me, but I have stopped it and deleted the app off my (laughs) phone just to stop that. Make sure you get on with your work. One of the things behind that, and I think this is a really interesting story more broadly for social media this year, is just how addictive short form video can be for the user. So if it's only a few seconds long, it's so easy to just keep watching. So you've got a five second video here, an eight second video there. It's not like you have to sit down and pay attention very carefully. You know, it it really appeals to that. (laughs) This great story amongst marketers that human beings have an increasingly diminishing attention span, which I'm not totally convinced about but I think that there's a very clear evidence that we do enjoy platforms that give us an endless stream of varied and changing content and I think you know one of the things that is very clear is that TikTok has totally appealed to that and it's created an experience that a lot of people do find addictive. Also one other underlying thing is that they are an AI company they have built all their apps on top of AI unlike Facebook which is actually building a lot more on psychological addiction. And I think there's a lot of difference between both companies, even though they are actually fighting for the same space. I mean, before I'm going to head out to the next question to you, I wanted to just ask you, what do you make of the recent Mark Zuckerberg article about privacy and focus on messaging apps? Yeah, I, w- I read that article two, three times just to make sure I did it properly. It, just, it fascinated me how he suddenly done this massive pivot into privacy. Now, whether this is genuinely his his belief or whether he's come to this conclusion after the beatings that he's had by politicians around the world over the last 12 months, I'm not totally sure. I think it's going to have some quite interesting implications in terms of where social media heads over the next few months. I think that the all the evidence that I'm seeing in terms of user behavior suggests that this is where users were headed anyway. So over the last three, maybe even five years, we've seen a very pronounced move from 
public sharing into private conversations. So if that is where the Facebook overall portfolio business is headed, then I would suggest that that's a very sensible move because it, it tracks what the users are doing anyway. But I'm not convinced I understand how the business model works from Facebook's perspective. So if you look at everything across the Facebook portfolio, whether it's the, the big blue app right the way through to things like Oculus and stuff like that, the conversations coming out of Facebook HQ are always about advertising revenues. There doesn't seem to be a very sort of diverse business model there. And I'm just curious to see how that's going to translate into these more private environments. We did see in that article, um, in that blog post that Mark Zuckerberg wrote that he was going to be trying to get into things like payments on WhatsApp. But I think especially after the scandals of the last few months, I'm not convinced that that's going to be the easiest to push for them. I think people are quite comfortable putting up a couple of personal details in order to be able to have conversations with their friends. But if Facebook asked you for your bank account details, I think there might be a little bit more hesitation there from people. Yeah, I think that, that's going to be an interesting one to keep an eye on. Oh, so I read that article very differently. I thought that he was almost saying that he's going to clone WeChat. And I think that he has actually finally found the solution to the payment problems that he had where WeChat doesn't have. So I think this is a conversation we have for the past few years. And I think I'd be also dig deeper and think deeper about the issue. I think the issue was that Tencent was able to build a payments engine from scratch that take off all the infrastructure costs that previously were set there, whereas Facebook was stuck with Master and Visa card. I mean, just to take a very simple number, right? Like, for example, if you look at the WeChat and the Alipay's, they are actually doing something like seven cents per transaction because I read this McKinsey report about the amount of payment infrastructure costs they're actually inducing on each transaction. Whereas Master and Visa card in any emerging market will slap you a three dollar US fees on every transaction. And where this is going to be interesting is that he has actually dedicated his team efforts towards blockchain. So I think he wants to clone WeChat for a very long time, and the only problem. This is between him and WeChat is payments. And I think he's going to try to solve it using the blockchain. I think this is where it converges, but it's four years too late because WeChat has also evolved, except that Tencent has not tried to really take it out of the Chinese market. Yeah. Bernard, I think this is a conversation you and I need to come back and have again in six months when we start seeing the changes on this and we can dig into it in real depth. Because I think if you look at the trends, especially around regions like APAC, mobile payments is kind of the most exciting topic. I'm just fascinated to see where Mark Zuckerberg and team take this because I think from a technology perspective whatever they do is going to be fascinating it's from a user perspective I'm not totally convinced but you know you, you mentioned WeChat and it's very clear now that the the payment system that they've developed not just for transactions within the platform but you know anywhere you go around the world now if you go to luxury stores in London or New York you can pay using WeChat in those stores as well. So very clear that they've made this a much more integrated system. I'm really impressed with the way that Tencent have done that. But in addition, you look at companies like Gojek and Grab in Southeast Asia and the payment platforms that they've built as well. Those are super interesting from my perspective and to see how those, if those manage to broaden out beyond Southeast Asia into the bigger world, then, you know, those fill me with a lot of optimism and excitement because it's very clear that the audiences have embraced them. But whether they do that on a platform like WhatsApp, I just have this weird instinctive feeling that I, I just don't see it working in the same way. I'm very happy to be proved wrong on this one, but my instinct at the moment is it's not the obvious evolution for WhatsApp. So it'll be very interesting to see how it pans out. Well, I'm definitely going to have you six months in reservation <laughs> to have this conversation because I think I've been thinking deeper about this conversation and I thought you would be the best person to have this discussion on. But coming back, in terms of social media, are there any new entrants in Asia that are interesting to look at but it hasn't been covered by your data set yet? That means they are coming but you haven't. You, it is not ready for prime time yet. Yeah, so we did include some basic data for Douyin stroke TikTok. I think that was definitely something that a lot of people want more information on. But like I said, frustratingly, I can only give you the headline number. I can't give you anything deeper. I think Halo going to be tracking that as we go forward as well. It's sort of a breakout story from the end of last year. So I don't have enough concrete data on it. And it's definitely not reached a worldwide scale yet. So we're apparently looking at somewhere around 60 to 70 million installs, which is pretty healthy, but still not at the quarter of a billion benchmark, which is the, the data that I'm reporting. Usually anything above quarter of a billion is where it starts to get 
it interesting. So I think those two are quite, you know, they may be ones to watch. I don't know whether Halo is going to be a very quick up and down in terms of its use, but nonetheless, if it's standing out as the top new app from last year from app. So this is data from Sensor Tower, by the way, which is one of those great app tracking companies. So together with App Annie, one of the ones that I rely on most to get my insights into what's happening in the world of apps. But beyond that, I think a lot of things come and go very quickly, especially in the APAC region. A lot of the success of social media platforms is determined by local culture and local language. So we see a lot of things at specifically local level that don't then make it beyond those countries and because of that they sort of they they go into steady declines after just a few months of success so I'm not seeing any major standout stories anywhere except for those interesting changes within China where you've got such a big audience that it's possible to get massive traction but unfortunately I think just my low level of being able to understand Mandarin and what goes on within China, I'm probably not the best person to talk about the uh, the in-depth China story. But you probably would want to start looking at them when their story became breakout of China, right? Oh, totally. So as soon as it becomes a more global story, and as soon as I start to be able to access information in English, then it becomes a lot easier. But I confess my language skills are the main barrier here. I do chat to Matt Brennan, you mentioned before. So he's one of the folks that I get my insights from as well. Great source of information on China for anybody else that wants to dig deeper from a global perspective. But obviously, there's a huge amount of stuff in local language. And I think it's still, I think a lot of people are still surprised by just how much the Chinese sort of internet world is still isolated from the rest of the world. And I don't mean that in a negative term. I just sort of mean, you know, it, it, China is still completely a world unto itself when it comes to digital, whether it's because of the, the sort of censorship and restrictions or whether it's just because the infrastructure is so much more integrated and so much more advanced than we see anywhere else in the world. You know, I'll, I'll let the, the listeners draw their own conclusions as to what's driving this. But I think it's just fascinating how you take an app as straightforward as, as WeChat and how it's become the entire internet in one app. I'm pretty sure we talked about this on the last podcast as well, but just the level of integration that they've got both online and offline and just in every aspect of daily life, it's only really in China that we see that. So yeah, I mean, I think, you know, definitely tracking what's happening in China. I just wish I could speak the language so I could understand more of it. Well, I having this known problem ever since I traveled to China a lot last year that now bringing cash in is a problem for me. And I have to figure out how to use the WeChat to actually do the payments. But I think I found a solution. Basically, you just need to find yourself a credit card with China Union Pay. And because the data goes into their Wang Lian system, they, that's why they accept it. So that's one way of hacking it. <laughs> I love the way that you're hacking financial systems. But you're right. I think, you know, looking at the changes in terms of just how easy it is to pay for things without WeChat in China, it's becoming increasingly difficult from what I can understand to, to you know, sort of pay for basic things like food and stuff. When you've got an app that gets to that level of integration in day-to-day life, you know that this is more than just a social media phenomenon and it's becoming more and more a remote control for daily life. So yeah, much as I don't have a huge amount of data on Tencent, I think just looking at the successes that they've developed, they, they are definitely not going to disappear anytime soon. They're, they're one of my top tips when I'm speaking to investors, just in terms of companies that I see having a very, very strong growth potential. What about companies like Snapchat, Twitter, Instagram, how are they doing in the social media space? Are their usage rates still growing or start to plateau across the world? So Instagram, very strong. I think we covered that a little bit earlier, so I'm not going to go into too much depth. But with the, with the slight exception of that 13 to 17 year old audience, everything else, so 18 and above, really strong growth over the last, consistently over the quarters that I've been tracking that Instagram data, it's just really impressive. And then you've got new formats in Instagram that are doing really well. So you've got the stories format is really taking off. It's very popular with the advertising community as well. So it's not just the users that are getting more excited. It's the the customers, if you like, the people that are paying um, Facebook for the, the services that are on Instagram. So I think we're going to see that continue at least for the next couple of quarters, probably even longer than that as well. I think Instagram's got plenty more potential behind it. So from the perspective of all sorts of growth, I think Instagram's definitely one to watch. I already mentioned that Snapchat, on the other hand, has got quite steady declines. And this is quite interesting because when they published their earnings announcements, they said that their daily active users were steady and hadn't changed. But the advertising audience, like I mentioned, down 12% in the final quarter of last year. So some interesting differences there. I'm not quite sure why those numbers are showing such a significant discrepancy. So I'm, I'm looking forward to collecting the next set of data and the next couple of months on how they've changed the advertising audience in the first 
first few months of 2019. So maybe we can have another follow-up conversation later in the year about how that's changed. Twitter's a really interesting one. So Twitter, you know, gentle declines in their total user base. So in the final quarter of last year, we saw them down one and a half percent. This is something that you know, they've been reporting in their earnings calls for the last couple of quarters. So this is not news to anybody. But what's really interesting when you look at the sort of the broader data sets around Twitter. So I thought that instead of just looking at what was happening on the active user base, I thought I would look at visits to the, the website and stuff like that as well. So we get some really good, solid insight data from similar web that helps me understand what's happening beyond a logged in user base. And it's really interesting to see that actually the number of visits to twitter.com has been steadily increasing for the last few months and the total number of unique visitors to twitter.com has also been going up so admittedly these sets of data are from different places and my suspicion is that there may be some duplication for people visiting from different kinds of devices and stuff so be careful how we interpret this data but nonetheless i think the data that twitter publishes suggests that it has just over 320 million active logged in users each month and yet the number of unique visitors to twitter.com is perhaps double that and that's a fascinating sort of situation to be in i think there's an awful lot of untapped value within the twitter world that perhaps its current business model isn't addressing now whether that means that twitter needs to change its business model or whether it means that twitter becomes increasingly appealing to a news brand that can make better sense of that audience that's one of the things that i'll be tracking quite carefully through this year my sense at the moment is that we need to stop thinking about Twitter as a social media platform and we need to start thinking of it more as that kind of news dissemination and as a place to go and learn about what's happening around the world. I mean, it's got huge amounts of potential. And interestingly, if you look at the financials from Twitter, they're incredibly strong. So it's just the investor community, I think, comparing it to Facebook and wondering why it's not delivering the same kinds of stuff is perhaps the greatest challenge that Jack Dorsey and team face. It's a misconception of what Twitter is and the value that it delivers rather than it actually having a real problem because I don't think it does. It's just kind of weird, right? I think it's interesting because I've recently listened to the Joe Regan Experience podcast and with Jack Dorsey as the guest and I thought he has made some very interesting points about looking at the health of the conversation. He zoomed down to quite detailed level about how Twitter is actually very good at doing conversations, how he's able to be a very quick public broadcast consider that you know the president of the united states is the largest troll and he probably <laughs> generated much more social media attentions for twitter but if you look at in terms of conversation level the meaningful conversations even for me i have is still on twitter not anywhere else yeah you're, you're definitely not alone in that and i think that the people around the world that are interested in knowing what's going on whether it's american politicians or politicians in the middle east or wh- wherever it may be you know twitter is still pos- possibly the the best place to be sharing immediate kinds of news activity. I think listening to what you were saying about the health of the conversation, I think this is where it starts to get quite interesting is that the comments that come around a lot of these news stories, if you look at the comment flow on any of Donald Trump's posts, for example, just the level of extreme opinions from one side of the spectrum to the other. I think if you go onto any other news site, you see this as well. So if you go onto a CNN that allows comments or whatever else, you notice in the comments that it's very similar. So I think a lot of the the commentators that are saying that the conversations on Twitter are unduly aggressive or it's a very hostile place. I think anywhere that reports news sees hostile conversations. I don't think that's unique to Twitter. But I think you're right that the conversation element in there is one of the most interesting bits of it. There was that, I don't know whether you saw this recently, but Kara Swisher from Decode, uh, Recode had it. Yes, I've read their entire interview as well. Right. So it's fascinating to see that, you know, even, even Twitter can't get it quite right when it's trying to do it. But the, the potential there to interact interact with people around the world that are interested in the same sort of hyper up-to-date stuff as you makes Twitter a unique place. And I think in my day-to-day work activities, if I want to engage with a journalist or if I want to engage with a, a business influencer, like you said, Twitter is probably the easiest place to do that. You might be able to have more in-depth relationships with somebody on LinkedIn, which is also a great platform, but Twitter is the best place for immediate, up-to-date, happening right now kinds of activities and conversations. So I don't quite understand why it's not got a better kind of valuation record 
because it, it, it shouldn't be competing with Facebook in any way whatsoever. They're completely different contexts. I, and I think this is something that we probably have to track. And after all, you know, it took about seven to eight years for Steve Jobs to turn around Apple. It probably would take seven to eight years before Jack Dorsey could turn around Twitter, given that he's running two companies at one time. <laughs> yeah, well, therein may be one of the problems, maybe a bit more focus, you know. <laughs> I want to get down to two interesting points you t- have talked about during uh, the early part of the conversation when you're trying to summarize the main gist of your report. One is on the public's attitudes towards privacy. And I think you have got some data on that. Can you tell me more what you have found in your report? Yeah, so I was quite surprised in terms of the countries that stand out as having the greatest sort of fear about privacy. Overall, the data, again, this is from Global Web Index. So this is based on a survey of uh, internet users all around the world. This is internet users who believe that their data is being misused online. Quite an inter- Sorry, that, this, this data set I'm about to talk to you, first of all, so this is from Statista. I'll come into the Global Web Index data in just a moment. So we reported that the, the privacy concerns in the 2019 report that we just published, we noticed that 40 of people worldwide, internet users, believe that their data may be being misused online. The latest data that we got from Global Web Index, which is just a couple of months more recent than that statistic data, that number jumped up to more than 60%. So you can see that there's this incredible sort of shift towards people that are nervous about how companies are using their data. I think what's really interesting is that, again, more, more research from Global Web Index suggested that 70% of internet users are more worried about their privacy today than they were this time last year. So this is a really important trend. But my suspicion is that when you ask somebody on the street, you know, the average person that isn't a, a massive tech nerd, if they're worried about their privacy online, the answer will be an immediate yes. But when you ask them about why that is or what they're concerned about, they start to get a little bit more, not necessarily confused, but they don't necessarily have the full story. My suspicion is that the media has been fueling this story very heavily, but the average person on the street doesn't really quite understand what the threats are and why they should be worried. This really aligns with what I think even some media research companies have actually pointed out. Actually, I think the user is actually very confused about what privacy really means to them. They do not know what to do about it. And hence, the usage is still remains the same. And probably that is also could be the reason why the big, big blue app hasn't seen any user decline because people know about the privacy problems, but people do not know what to do about it. Yeah, and I think, you know, if you let's take Facebook as the, the easiest way of talking about this, the threats of this mysterious thing called privacy, where in all honesty, I know that I've been told I need to worry about it, but when something happens, like a massive data hack or whatever else, the average user doesn't feel the consequences of that. And I think this is the, the most important thing is that until there is a very tangible personal consequence to data privacy issues, the benefit of using Facebook versus the fear of what privacy means, they're, they're completely separate. You know, people cannot quantify the risks, but they can very easily experience the benefits. And so from that perspective, they say they're worried about it, but they're not changing their behavior. You know, we, we see this in all sorts of aspects of life. It's like, you know, not doing enough exercise and not eating healthily is because the immediate benefits of enjoying unhealthy food and not exercising are much more tangible than the potential much later in life for the damage that it does if we don't lead a healthy lifestyle. So I think this is one of those things that we're going to probably see governments all around the world getting more active in terms of trying to educate people about the risks online. I think this is a really important part of education. I don't believe that education systems have had an opportunity to catch up as quickly as the user behavior sort of requires. So whether it's people coming online for the first time in India, right the way through to people in the Western world that have been online for 20 years, we still need a greater amount of education on what the risks are and how to behave sensibly in that sort of very public and sort of increasingly pervasive digital world. So yeah, let's let's keep tracking that data. I think it's interesting to know what the user feels and believes about privacy, but I think that data doesn't necessarily tell us a great deal about what's actually happening in terms of behaviors. And it definitely doesn't give us a perspective on whether these people understand the risks and the dangers. It feels like New York Times have broken so many investigative reports on Facebook about the violation of privacy, but they have not actually taught the public how to deal with it. Yeah. What's possibly most frustrating about that is that 
Facebook is a little bit reactive in its approach to dealing with privacy. So it waits until it gets a slap on the wrist or a, a big sort of scandal from a journalist before it does something. I think the easiest thing in the world to deal with this issue is to just take a much more proactive stance on it and say, you know, we, without our users, we're a bit screwed. So we need to look after them a bit better. And I suppose I'm a little bit disappointed that we don't see more of that coming through from the social media platforms. On the flip to that, one of the most interesting developments that I've been tracking in the recent months is the new initiative from Tim Berners-Lee. So the guy that invented the World Wide Web is now working with the folks at MIT to develop this thing called SOLID, which stands for Socially Linked Data. And it is a totally new concept of how we deal with data and privacy on the internet. So that the main fundamental part of SOLID is that it moves ownership of the data back to the individual rather than it being owned by big platforms like Google and Facebook. Now, from a conceptual perspective, it's absolutely brilliant. And it's one of those things that I'd love to see come through very fast and become a, a sort of central part of the future of the internet. I think there's a couple of structural challenges to making that happen. But I think we're going to see increasingly other organizations, other companies trying to make sense of data more from the user's perspective and to help sort of rebalance the equation better in the favor of the everyday person on the street. I might just want to get you back for another time to talk about e-commerce and crypto from your report. This will be my last question. What would be the data that you will most want to get your hands on for 2019 in Asia Pacific? I'm, I know you wanted the WeChat data, the Douyin data. What else? It, well, yeah, it's the, it's the Tencent data most. First of all, I really love deep dive into that WeChat data. I think beyond that, no, I think I'm, I'm good for now. That's my top of my wish list is the, the 10 cent stroke WeChat data. Somebody out there's got to give it to me sometime. So if anybody's listening that can help with that, please give me a shout. Oh, no, not lying, Kakao Talk as well. To be honest, I speak to those guys fairly regularly. So I do get a little bit of insight from Line, but again, not broken down. But because Line is just Japan and Kakao is just kind of Korea in terms of its key audiences, um, much as they're interested interesting, it wouldn't be top of my list. Sure, I'd love to get that data, but I think that just the sheer scale of the stuff that's happening on WeChat, I just love much more information about what's happening there. So yeah, obviously, you know me, Bernard, I'll take anything I can get, any more data. <laughs> if anybody's got anything they want to share, please send it my way. I think you might want to look at Line because I think the Taiwan and the Thailand usage is actually pretty interesting, but I'm going to leave it here. Simon, many thanks for coming on the show. And I seriously want to get you on at least two more times this year. It means that it can be more. <laughs> So in closing, can you recommend a book, movie, podcast, or anything that recently made an impact to your work and personal life? Ooh, no. <laughs> it's a very scary answer. Do you know, I haven't had a chance to read almost any kind of book in the last six months at all. So no tips there. The one thing that I would suggest, though, and one of the things that sort of impacted a lot of my thinking around the marketing world is broadening out the kinds of content that you look at on Netflix. So Netflix is a great place to get all sorts of different kinds of cultural content. And I think one of the bits that's really helped me take different perspectives ironically even from an understanding how digital gets used is watching content in completely random languages from different countries around the world on netflix so that would probably be my only tip for popular culture i'm afraid not very exciting but hopefully useful nonetheless no i think you are totally spot on, on that and because uh, i've started using netflix and i realized that they are trying to recommend me things that I keep watching and I've started decided that I should just randomize my watch list so that you couldn't get a sense of who I am <laughs> so I started discovering more content as a result of that protect your privacy on Netflix as well that's right how do my audience find you um, they can find me on LinkedIn as Simon Kemp they can find me on Twitter as Eskimon if they struggle with that they can always give you a shout and hopefully you can connect us yeah and I will always do because you can Google me at Bernard Leong and you can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Acast, Spotify, and also iTunes. And of course, give us a five-star rating on Apple iTunes Store, a star on Overcast and Pocket Cast. And of course, you can also now find us on Himalaya too. And once again, Simon, I would definitely want to continue this conversation with you and let's make a time and we'll chat again. Look forward to it. Thanks for having me on the show again, Bernard.